Audio Track 4 Piercing the Elastic Limit and Epic Fable by Howard Loring Read by the Author Copyright 2012 by Precognition Press, LLC Chapter 3 The Oracle's Gift Agrippa was dressing on the far bank when Caesar returned. As chance would have it, he was looking at the rock face when the portal's dark opening materialized. Almost at once, Caesar strutted out. Agrippa froze, at first not knowing if what he gazed upon was real. By now he knew that anything was possible here. This mysterious oracle of Munda had proved beyond doubt the vast power it commanded, and a false vision was entirely possible. Caesar removed his concern. Are you well, Marcus? the great man asked him from across the stream. Are you being sufficiently looked after, my boy? Food and drink aplenty. Yes, Caesar, he answered. Only my pride has been wounded. I'm not used to such a disadvantage. I'm afraid, Caesar replied, that can't be helped. Scrutinizing everything, he next looked to the horses that had been unsaddled some time ago. The animals were contentedly crunching grain from a manger. It had appeared earlier, while Agrippa sat his bath. Heaps of hay piled beside them also had been conjured up from nowhere. Your audience is over, asked Agrippa. Oh, my, no, answered Caesar. We've a while yet, I'd say. But tell me this, my good man. How long have I been within the oracle's sanctum? An hour, maybe two, was Agrippa's answer. Caesar was pleased at this response. Marvellous, he chortled. Then he explained. From my point of view, I've been gone near a week's duration. Yet this morning I wished to see for myself if time had slowed for you, as I had been assured it would be. A week, asked Agrippa. He was stunned. So far his day had seemed quite normal to him, although unproductive as things stood. Do you need anything? asked Caesar. Just some answers, was the reply. Yet you have set my mind at ease in one regard. My biggest question was for your personal safety. Caesar nodded understanding his position. I am well, he reassured him. The oracle has everything in hand. It seems nothing is beyond his purview, and we've progressed much these last few days. Agrippa considered this. Here was Caesar, no doubt about it, and alive and in fine fettle to boot. Yet, the young commander still had misgivings, and they would continue until he and the great man were once more back within the cohort's strong embrace. How much longer, then, do you think? he asked. I've no idea, was the answer. All I know is that this opportunity must be taken fully. I cannot proceed until it has been, regardless of duration. This time Agrippa nodded. He knew further argument was moot. Caesar was Caesar after all, and to deter him from his path was no small thing. Have a care, he said. The oracle so far has proved itself sweet. But things do spoil sometimes, and then who knows what the future may hold. 
The great man was much amused by this remark. The double meaning was well played, yet it made no difference to Caesar's agenda. He turned while chuckling and re-entered the portal. Seconds later the dark archway vanished as before. Agrippa shook his head once more. When Caesar emerged, he found the girl waiting in the hallway. This had been a constant happenstance during his stay. She was always present before and after each audience, and now the two of them meshed perfectly. Agrippa is well, she asked, knowing the answer. I also, he said, realizing her hidden point. My mind is much relieved. And then, you don't think less of me for wishing to be reassured. How could anyone, she asked with a straight face, think less of you for anything you do? How could such noble motives as yours ever be questioned? And what purpose, pray tell, could it serve anyone to do so? Caesar had a great belly laugh at these remarks. Her irony was ever present, he'd learned, and she knew how to use it. Her dry sense of humor was unlike any that he had recently encountered. For years no one, including neither family nor close friends, had dared speak to him with anything but great deference, and her frank banter was a refreshing change. The girl could cut to the bone with searing sarcasm that was not in any way tempered by concern for his higher station or lofty position. Yet she did so with such intent towards being pleasant that it was evident to him that no malice ever was intended, so none was ever taken. She was always great. Fun. We've a short wait, I fear, she said, indicating a large bench in the hallway that had not been there before. Caesar nodded and sat, comfortable now within her gentle direction. After a beat, he patted the vacant space beside him, and the girl also sat. The portal now stood mute before them, sealed with neat courses of large bricks, filling its arched opening. After so many days, Caesar almost had come to take such wonders for granted. Yet his many audiences with the old man beyond the masonry had been even more wondrous. The insight he'd gained from them was nothing short of astounding. He'd thought in terms before unknown to him about aspects of his life that he'd believed unimportant in the main, but even so he was yet to form the proper question. How long, he inquired of her, have you served the powerful oracle of Munda? From the beginning was her answer. It has been a true honor always, as well as a privilege. It's a very gratifying duty to assist the old one. I can only imagine, he agreed. But how long have you been doing thus? You must have some conception, some idea of duration involved. Time is irrelevant here, she said, and such a notion therefore meaningless. I serve the oracle and always will. It is my mandate. Caesar admired her commitment, but knew she was being evasive. She was expert at deception. He tried again, never satisfied with an unfulfilled agenda. But others have come, he asked. She nodded and answered, many. 
but almost all have stayed for only a short period. In the end, most shrink from or are unable to form the proper question. I see, muttered Caesar. He knew from his own experience that the deep commitment needed was often painful to pursue. He realized now that the safer course was not to think of the deeper meaning, but just live the day-to-day -day life as if that was all that mattered. Yet Caesar's audiences with the Oracle of Munda had put an end to such thinking, and now he was very interested in the higher purpose of his life. Concerns of this kind had never entered into his schemes before. He had been cunning and ruthless in the past, but his vast drive had held no function beyond his own self-aggrandizement. However, in the last days he had learned by degrees that what he had sought all along was not raw power per se, but only the ever-expanding platform that such power had afforded him. In his discourse with the oracle, he'd realized that each sequential step taken to elevate his public position, every strategy along the way to further his reach, had contained a much richer purpose. Of course, he hadn't been aware of it at the time, but now he was, and so at last he understood his true motivation. He had been searching for knowledge his entire life, not glory. He was not driven forward by greed or ambition, as his many detractors always implied, but by his unattainable, unquenched thirst for insight, and now he saw that the process had been ever increased by the fact he seldom achieved any. So he would continue on, despite the time or efforts involved, for the rewards of such a difficult labor were self-evident to him now, and he was close. Soon he would narrow it down to the most basic and specific terms, and, at last, form the proper question that would frame what it was that he really wished to know. It's been an illuminating experience, to be sure, he observed, but will you have no life beyond the oracle? Have you no ambition for something different? She cocked her head at his question. He wasn't sure if the inquiry itself, or the fact that he had asked it, prompted the movement, but her smile returned. I am the only guide to the Oracle of Munda, she said, as she extended her finger. Caesar turned his head. The passageway, dark as ever, had returned. He laughed again and slapped his knee. She was a true gem, and there was no denying it. He would miss her when his audience was over. He stood and looked at her as he stepped to the portal. She stood also, and her green eyes met his jet-black ones. He nodded and walked in. Agrippa was still standing on the far bank of the stream, trying to decide his next move. He knew a further attack on the portal was futile. The hole he dug earlier had simply sealed itself while he was bathing. 
yet he was not one to sit and do nothing he had to fill his time with some distraction remembering he had a book of rhetoric in his kit he looked over to where he had stacked the horse's tack it wasn't there he glanced over to the animals and saw them saddled and waiting their feed now vanished looking back to the portal he saw his cleaned tunic folded next to his now polished armor guards and helmet all resting on the blanket that before was under the large grass basket of food the basket was also gone agrippa had just dressed after his bath but it seemed that conditions here were changeable in the blink of an eye yet he knew his duty and he quickly crossed the stream in order to suit up again only minutes later as he was cinching his last breastplate buckle the portal's dark passageway reappeared caesar then emerged his armor also newly polished his helmet tucked under his arm back on the plain at the rear of the cohort the embattled centurion was yet in discussion with his grizzled second in command both were still mounted trotting into camp with the other men riding a few paces behind pickets on duty at the front of the cohort's position then began to shout and raise a cry the centurion saw two horsemen in the distance and they were coming in fast he first ordered the legionnaires about him to stay alert and hold their ground and then he and his second galloped off to assess the situation by now the man thought that nothing would surprise him but again he was wrong caesar and agrippa had slowed to a walk by the time the two men reached them both soldiers saluted as they pulled up the great man and his younger companion looked none the worse for wear caesar cried the centurion thank the gods we feared for your safety caesar raised his eyebrow at this unusual pronouncement but didn't respond however agrippa who was in command of the cohort could tell that something out of the ordinary had happened to upset his men he wanted details report he barked sir the centurion replied we've been bewitched strange things have occurred since you two left us we can't explain them what things asked the young commander looking around he saw nothing to indicate a problem the cohort seemed encamped as usual well sir the centurion began to respond but the man became flustered and could not go on not knowing where to begin his strange tale the guide is missing said his second we took all precautions but to no avail she vanished before our eyes leaving nothing but her robe behind sorcery pure and simple concurred the centurion at last finding his voice at this caesar smiled but just a bit here was a punishable offence legionnaires were famous for claiming divine intervention to explain lax discipline and often did so when facing the lash or worse and you did nothing demanded agrippa leaning forward in his saddle to emphasize his impatience the poor centurion looked as if he'd been struck in the face again he could not speak 
again his second in command chimed in with an answer we set double sentries and posted pickets sir his scarred face explained then he rode north after you but in two minutes he arrived from the south his horse lathered and winded as if he'd been riding for an hour and i did sir added the centurion i galloped hard always north yet came up from the south with the cohort in front of me not behind blast it it's true i swear on the honour of the entire fifth legion caesar and agrippa exchanged a look caesar still said nothing waiting to see how agrippa would handle the situation agrippa wanted more information let me understand he began after the guide vanished you rode for an hour but were gone for only a few minutes and the cohort had not moved not a pace stated the second agrippa leaned back in his seat for romans torture would be the standard procedure employed to arrive at the truth both legionnaires knew this caesar took control he removed his helmet and handed it to the second his stoic face looked old but as usual held an unreadable demeanour this barren plain is indeed cursed he proclaimed we also have been on a fool's errand the guide's instructions failed to yield the oracle's position all knew then that the great man had accepted the veracity of his legionnaire's report we had a good view of the countryside but that's all agrippa explained we looked everywhere yet no oracle was found despite our best efforts but we had expected to question the guide further it can't be helped marcus said caesar it's not meant to be i fear all of us have been trifled with and for no good reason that i can see the centurion at last was relieved now once more his betters were in charge and he could get back to his normal duties he couldn't wait orders he inquired of caesar the great man considered munda still stood his agenda remained unfulfilled saddle the men caesar decreed my legions await me and i've wasted a full day then never one to be held he trotted off into the heart of the cohort the year was forty five b c caesar soon subdued the province and the once vast armies of pompey the great were no more the long civil war was over any further resistance to his will now was broken and caesar returned to rome an acclaimed hero ironically viewed as the saviour of the republic yet all memory of the oracle had been swept away from both caesar and agrippa just as soon as they had vacated the area the great man never thought with fondness of the pretty young girl with the large green eyes agrippa never recalled the many wonders displayed outside the mysterious oracle of munda but caesar had been successful in his quest even though he would never recall that fact during his last session within the oracle's sanctum 
he came to realize precisely what it was that he wished the most to know so in the end he had indeed formed the proper question in doing so he had given the oracle a larger gift because framing the proper question had held another consequence it permitted caesar's brain waves to align in a certain specific way this unique but correct sequence could not be artificially induced only generated naturally by the person involved and only after they had sufficiently arranged their thought patterns this rare phenomenon was normally unrecognized and therefore unknown for when it did occasionally occur in someone it seldom was a permanent condition in caesar's case it wasn't long-lasting yet when he did form the proper question his correctly prepared brain had produced a unique and very potent form of human energy and once achieved this powerful natural force had been successfully harnessed and drawn off then collected and stored for later use the oracle planned to employ it well when the suitable opportunity arrived but it made no difference to history itself nor to caesar's own personal history time marched on even for him and his destiny had been long set the next year proved eventful to say the least rendered impotent by caesar's victorious and loving legions the senate raced to ingratiate itself and elected him dictator for life less than one month later at age fifty-five he was assassinated